Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hi, everybody. I'm Jessa, and I'm so happy you're here for this episode of Better Sex. I've dedicated my professional life to helping couples enjoy a fulfilling, intimate life. I believe that sex is important. Our connections to other people matter, and we're not living our life to the fullest if we aren't connecting emotionally and sexually with our partner. That's why I'm here, bringing ideas and information to help you live and love better. Well, the last episode of my podcast was about pregnancy and sexuality, and it seemed to make sense to go right into the next obvious topic, which is postpartum sexuality. Because talk about a lot of change to adjust to, because you've got not only the physical impact of carrying and birthing a baby, you've got the emotional, the psychological, and the relational impacts as well. Life is not the same once you've had a baby. You're going to be exhausted. You're going to be focused on the baby. You're going to have trouble maybe getting the bandwidth to take care of other things in your life right away. You've got the transition of your role with your partner now that you're a mom or a dad. I mean, everything is different. And it really can throw your sex life for a loop. I mean, not only do you probably need to wait whatever amount of time before you resume sex, that's just before you sort of can resume sex. Then there's the issue of when do you want to? How do you get back in a state of mind where you want to engage physically with your partner? How do you nurture that? How do you communicate about it with your partner? There's a lot of transition there to go through. So I found a guest today who I'm so excited about. Tammy Sen is a certified nurse midwife and a women's health nurse practitioner, and she's practicing in Central Maryland. She's got over 20 years of experience guiding women through pregnancy, birth, and new motherhood, and working with families in those same timeframes. She provides reproductive and gynecologic care for women of all ages, and she's received advanced training in sexual concerns, including evaluation and treatment, as well as counseling and education. So I think she's a perfect person to come in and talk about everything that happens when you add the baby to the family, the impacts on sex, sort of what you can expect, although there's not just one thing to expect, and what you can do about it. So very delighted that she's here with me today. So, Tammy, thank you so much for being here to talk to me today. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited to be a part of this. This is such good work that you're doing. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think this is a really important topic, postpartum sexuality. Obviously, most of my listeners are not going to be in a postpartum period right now, but it's the kind of thing a lot of people encounter, and I just don't think it's talked about enough. So I'm really delighted that you're here. Yes, I I completely agree with you. We prepare women so well for other aspects of pregnancy and motherhood and other phases of life, but we don't really talk about this phase of life, I think, enough to help women have the guidance that they need. Yeah. So what kind of of impacts on people's sex lives do they have once they've had a baby? Like, what, what are the common ways it makes a difference? Midwives tend to talk about this period of time, the first three months after babies are born, as the fourth trimester of pregnancy, because the work of pregnancy isn't really done yet. You've had this baby, something you've dreamed about, something you fantasized about. And for most women, the experience is nothing like they expected. And as we talked about, there are so many physical changes. You may be exhausted. You may have some pelvic discomfort, some genital discomfort, breast discomfort. In addition to the physical changes, there are emotional tasks to tackle. There are relationship changes is a game changer in every area of life. And as you know, every area of life affects your sexual functioning. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking about what you were saying about it. You know, a lot of people, it's different than what they expected. (laughs) I had to stop myself from laughing out loud because yes, it is very different. 
and then, sounds like you've had that experience. I have had that experience. And you have a <laughs> fantasy or this vision, but until you do it, at least the first time, you really don't have much of an idea. Yes. And I find that's exactly the case. First time moms, it's almost a, a culture shock. We do fantasize and romanticize the, the childbearing experience. And to go home and, and just basic functions like bowel and bladder for some women are a challenge. Well, for other women, they go home and they feel fantastic and, and have none of those effects. So it can be a very different experience for every woman. Yeah, yeah. And I guess you were saying basically there are physical impacts, potentially. There are the emotional ones. There's relational ones. I mean, you know, I suppose there's maybe you'd even say spiritual ones. I mean, there's so much change that goes on with adding a baby to the family. Oh, definitely. I find that a lot of women really reconnect and evaluate their spiritual beliefs in preparation for starting a family um, because it's so important to clarify what do I believe and what do I want to pass on and and what sort of legacy do I want to leave? And that also, as you know, plays an important part in how we express ourselves sexually. Right, right. And then then there's the role transition too, right? I mean, maybe that's an emotional component, but this idea of being a sexy woman at the same time that I'm a mother of an infant, sort of a a dichotomy or something there. Yes, yes, exactly. And women tend to be so relationally oriented. And this does change every relationship. Maybe you defined yourself as a professional person. Maybe you defined yourself in terms of your partner relationship, maybe in terms of your familial relationships. And now suddenly you're responsibilities or what you can give to each relationship is very different. And that especially with your partner relationships, they can no longer perhaps be your priority. And that can cause a little bit of of friction. Yeah, definitely. When I talk to couples in therapy, trying to prioritize each other and make time to invest in the relationship, I mean, it's a common theme. I don't know if there's another time that's as challenging as when you add a baby to the family. I mean, that makes it so difficult. Yeah, I think in addition to, we put so much pressure on ourselves because we've internalized these societal messages for what we should be. We should always be well-groomed. We should always be the caregiver. We should always be ecstatically happy in this period. And, you know, it's okay to be real. It's okay to wear the sweatpants and have the stain on your shirt and not really be in the mood to be sexy. Mm -hmm. You know, you've had these sexual changes, you've had these bodily changes for a lot of women. It, there are body image issues. You look in the mirror and you don't recognize this body that you're living in. Maybe it's not behaving in the way that you thought it would or functioning in the way that you expected. And so sometimes that that is something that needs to be reckoned with. Yeah, yeah. It's a, that's. A, I mean, it's been a, quite a while since I've actually had my last baby, but it's bringing back the memories of how complex that time is. And I think you're right. It's very complex. And I think most women anticipate the physical changes. But as with any life changes, I think we're less able to really look into the future and see what those psychological tasks will be or what the relational changes will be. Yeah, yeah. And and a lot of that depends on how the world around us responds to. We maybe can't predict how our partner will respond to the situation and they have um, things to adapt to of their own. Right. Do you want to address any of the, the physical effects of childbirth that might affect sex? I think for most women, the biggest thing is fear mm-hmm. of resuming sexuality because they do find that they maybe have some pelvic discomfort. They're crampy Um, Maybe they've had some postpartum bleeding. Maybe they've had some genital stitches. Maybe they are still a bit swollen. And so they're understandably nervous about how this is going to affect their sexual functioning. Will it be painful? When is the right time to resume? Things such as vaginal dryness, Mm. which a lot of women don't anticipate. If you're breastfeeding, breast leakage, maybe nipple pain, a lot of unexpected sensations that can happen. Yeah, yeah. What's involved in the recovery period, you know, process and like transitioning into having this baby? Like, you know, how are you working with your patients or clients around that? What do you, what do you, what do you, I mean, I don't know if there are stages for this. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure no two journeys are exactly the same, but, you know, sort of what's the process to resuming 
your sex life and your intimate relationship with your partner again? I think most women do focus on the physical. And the first and most important is to make sure that you are physically healed in that area. Um, I think there's a myth among women that perhaps women who have vaginal births have a much more difficult time recovering than women who have cesarean births, but that's not necessarily true. Mm. What we find is that, you know, in the first three or four weeks when there may be, I I, I hesitate to say trauma because that sounds like such a, a negative word. Right, right. But when you may have some lacerations or some swelling or some pain in that area, um, of course, you're going to be less interested in sex than someone who didn't have those wounds. But over time, what we find is that after three months, six months, it doesn't make a difference. Women who have had either method of birth have very similar concerns and very similar physical issues that they talk about. Okay. So getting through the initial healing, the first two weeks for all women are usually pretty tiring, pretty overwhelming because you're not an expert on your baby yet. And it takes a lot of effort and a lot of energy to become an expert on the baby. And so all of your emotional energy goes into nurturing that relationship. So it can be very difficult to stay connected with your partner. And that can take a task. Often partners feel a little left out of the loop. So these are things that even if you wanted to work on them, perhaps neither of you has the resources to do that right now because sleep is so precious and babies are so time consuming. We usually recommend as soon as it doesn't hurt, start some Kegel exercises, the vaginal tightening exercises so that you can get some muscle tone back. And we talk about bowel and bladder function because they're very basic, but they're very important. And I think women shouldn't hesitate if they're having ongoing issues to to talk about maybe it's time to go for a physical therapy referral. That's an important part of the recovery process. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I think women are often hesitant to reach out before that golden six-week visit. Yeah, because that's a standard, right? Let me see you in six weeks and we'll just sort of check in and see, give you the A-OK at that point. Yeah, and you know... It's funny to to recognize that that really isn't based on any evidence. Oh. (laughs) It's really just based on tradition. For most women, it's an adequate healing time for, you know, some of the processes like the uterine involution where the uterus returns to its pre-pregnancy size. It takes about six weeks. But many women feel like themselves again after two weeks. Many women don't really need additional healing time after three to four weeks. So Mm. it's, as you said, a very different journey. And we give this guideline of six weeks, but some women need to see us sooner. Some women have questions or concerns sooner. So I hope women will realize that it's okay to reach out earlier. Right, right. And similarly, not everybody's going to be ready in six weeks either. I mean, you know, sometimes the recovery process or time is going to take longer than that. Yeah, exactly. You know, if we look at statistics, when we research these issues, we find that within six weeks, about 50% of women are ready to resume some sort of sexual activity or have resumed. And, you know, when we're talking about heterosexual women, we're, we're usually implying intercourse, but we have to remember that's not always the case for every relationship. That intercourse isn't always the gold standard for sexual activity. By about the three months, 80% of women are ready to resume intercourse. And we find that within the first year, anybody who wants to be sexually active usually is. Mm-hmm. But that there is a lot of variety, as you can imagine. Right, right. Well, I was going to say, so we've got the physical healing and recovery and, and um, adapting to have a, a baby in your life, right? That's some of the recovery and transition process. Is there anything else you want to highlight about that? Like what people can expect or how to move through that even relationally with their partner? I think it's important to say communication with your partner is important. There's no right or wrong way we often get hung up on that term of normal and normal is so restricting and produces so much unnecessary anxiety. Um, If it's concerning, reach out to your healthcare provider, but there's no right or wrong way to do this. And as far as your relations, it's okay to negotiate what you need. Mm -hmm. What do you see on the impact on sexual desire, you know, beyond the sort of physical impacts of the birth and getting over the initial exhaustion and things like that. But are people talking to you about changes in their interest in being sexual and for how long after the birth of a baby? 
I always sort of explain it as mother nature's way of making sure that you're paying attention to the baby instead of making more babies before you're ready. Some women are very interested in sex before they see me again. Mm -hmm. Other women, it takes a while. We talked a little bit about wanting to talk about how breastfeeding affects right. sex health. And I think this is the perfect opportunity to talk about that. We have a lot of hormonal influences. Not only are you very tired, usually when there's a newborn in the house, and it changes your relationship. And if you had issues before the baby came, it, it sort of brings them to the surface. But breastfeeding, you've got a lot of hormonal influences that women aren't really prepared for. And I find that women have a lot of questions about this or seem quite surprised when they come back to talk to me at their follow-up visits. You know, we talk about the hormone oxytocin and we think of that as being the love hormone, the bonding hormone. And we get a, a little burst of oxytocin each time we breastfeed, but we find that for new parents, the brain chemistry changes. And rather than having that oxytocin that makes us attached to our partner as it does with sex and orgasm that we get oxytocin, when there's a newborn involved and we're breastfeeding, it sort of makes us focus more on the baby and less interested in our partner. And we go more into a caregiving mode than we do into a saucy kind of. Yeah, yeah. So that definitely changes. Um, we also have a lot of the, the hormone prolactin. It's really important to maintain breast milk, breastfeeding lactation. And prolactin has a very profound impact on your sexuality as well. We also get a little burst of prolactin after orgasm, and it gives us what some people would call a sense of sexual satiety. Mm -hmm. Thanks, no more, I'm good. And so when you have these sustained high levels of prolactin necessary to breastfeed, you get this ongoing sense of, no, thanks. I don't need any. Sexuality. Yeah, I'm good. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and important to note for both men and women, our prolactin levels increase when we're under stress. Uh -huh. This is a pretty stressful time for both new moms, new dads, new parents, new grandparents. So we often find that our, our interest in sexuality wanes. And then we also have the hormone estrogen, which most of us are familiar with. Right. Estrogen and prolactin act sort of in opposition to one another. So when you have these high levels of prolactin, it tends to counteract the effects of estrogen, which leads to vaginal dryness, decreased lubrication, which can make sex a little more challenging. Right, right. So when you're already tired and sex becomes a little more chore-like as it does for some women, it can also be an interrupter for your sexual activity. I mean, obviously, a fair amount of this is just par for the course. I mean, this is to be expected. Yes. If you're going to have a baby, if you're going to breastfeed a baby, not everybody's going to experience it exactly the same way. But I think to normalize this for people is important. Yes. Yeah. And not to think, well, three months later, we should be going at it just like we were before. Is not really, that's not a realistic expectation. You know, for some women, it may be. Right, right. But not necessarily, right? Not everybody's going to experience that. And I think we also miss out on a lot of the cultural messages for breastfeeding. I often find a lot of questions. A lot of women are shocked, surprised that when they are sexual, when they start to get aroused, that they'll have a little bit of leakage from their breasts, a normal mm -hmm. letdown response. And for some couples, this is kind of funny. Maybe we can work that into our sexual repertoire. Maybe it's even a little sexy. For other couples, it can be a little off-putting and maybe yeah. a little bit of an interrupter. You know, I also find that women are very surprised and very afraid to ask about the natural feelings of sexual stimulation that can go along with breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Breasts are naturally an erogenous zone for women, and it's not unusual. It's a normal physiologic response that some women will feel a little bit aroused in their genitals as they breastfeed, but they're afraid to speak of this because they're afraid of the stigma attached to being aroused by a child, by their yeah. child. Yeah. And then another biggie that I find with breastfeeding women, almost universally at some point, women during those months of breastfeeding will say to me, and I haven't seen this in the literature, so I just call it touch fatigue. Uh, yes. <laughs> Women will say, and you may remember this if you breastfed, I feel like 
somebody always wants a piece of my body. The baby is breastfeeding. My partner wants to touch me. I feel like my body isn't even my own. I just want five minutes with nobody touching me. Yeah. And even, even if people aren't nursing, I hear that kind of thing about being a new mother and like the demands, everybody wants something for me. It's, I'm such a giver and it's hard to then want to give sexually, relationally with a partner at that point. It is, it is. And I think we have been taught as women that we are caregivers, but we forget about self-care. And I think it's an important time in life when we need to think about self-care. Right. Hi, it's Jessa here, taking just a quick break. Thanks for listening so far. I wanted to let you know about the sex quiz that I've put together called How Healthy Is Your Sex Life? I've taken a close look at the typical ways that I see couples get into trouble with sex, including avoidance, neglect, negativity, distraction, and boredom. And the free quiz will score your individual results based on these factors. And then I provide my recommendations and ideas, including my top 10 sex tips, which will help you make instant improvement. If you'd like to take the quiz and see how healthy your sex life is, you can do it right now at sexhealthquiz.com. Is there anything else you want to say about, you know, when and how people might resume sexual activity? You know, and I guess it's different if it's penetration of some sort or not, but... It is. And, and you know, we, we find that returning to sexual activity typically follows a pattern for women as their comfort increases during this recovery time. We often find that women will say they're engaging in giving oral sex to their partner first because that feels safe. That feels comfortable. Mm-hmm. I don't have to worry about, is it going to be uncomfortable for me physically? I don't have to worry about risks of pregnancy because for some women, that's a very real fear until they can establish some sort of contraception. So first is oral sex for my partner. And then women will self-stimulate, self-explore just to make sure that uh, it's not painful. And sometimes they have urges, but they're not ready to let a partner be that intimate with them yet. Yeah. And so then typically, once they're comfortable with self-stimulation, they'll move on to partnered activities. And and this may be intercourse, this may be other activities, it may be penetrative, it may not be. And then finally, the last step is typically if women enjoy receiving oral sex, that's usually the last thing that they're comfortable returning to because they're concerned about, about the recovery process. Yeah, yeah. Again, there's nothing normal, but often women wonder, you know, how is my experience compared to other women? Right, right. And there's nothing that dictates a timeline. Like you said, the six weeks thing isn't really based on evidence. So it's, it sounds to me like it's a little bit a matter of using some caution and paying attention to how things are feeling, you know, exactly. use, use pain as a guide. <laughs> um, yeah, pain is your body's way of communicating with you. So that is a very good way to tell. And if you're not emotionally ready, you've done a a couple of episodes about uh, consent. And I think this is a very important time where women need to to have those consent conversations and, and be assertive that I'm not comfortable, I'm not ready. And even though your partner may be eager for sexual activity, doesn't mean that you have to go beyond the boundaries that you're comfortable with right now. Yeah, it's certainly a good time to add, you know, consent awareness because while it's it's certainly always important, this is a time where almost everything would have to be checked in again. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Another thing that I find, and this goes back to those societal messages from women, typically I'll ask women at their postpartum visit, have you tried sex yet? Mm -hmm. And we know that about half of women probably have. But often women are afraid to say, yes, I've had sex because we haven't taken ownership or we're not allowed by society's messages to take ownership of our body, to take ownership of our pleasure. Mm. So women will often, instead of expecting me to say, so how did it go? Expect me to say, well, you shouldn't have done that. Wow. And I, I hope that women come away from this with the message that It is your body. And as long as you're using good decision making and you're comfortable and you feel physically ready, 
that it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. To have sexual activity and it's okay to look out for your pleasure and that your partner doesn't own your permission and that your healthcare provider doesn't own your permission. These are decisions for you to make that you have that autonomy. Yeah. Yeah. So I definitely wanted to touch on postpartum depression. Yes. And I know, you know, you're not a mental health counselor or something, but I imagine it's something that you're sort of checking for and advising people about, you know, be on the lookout for and what do people do? Oh, definitely. What do you want to say about that? I guess I'll give you sort of a broad question to start. So I think people don't realize how common it is and how important it is to identify. Um, Even women who are depressed often don't recognize it. Yeah. It is the most common complication of pregnancy. Hmm. So on average, about one in seven women will experience postpartum depression. And this is different than the baby blues. The baby blues are usually that time period in the first two weeks when you're learning about your baby and you're feeling quite tired. And for most women, that's a very emotional time. Yeah. After two weeks, if you don't feel like you're getting a handle on things, if you're not feeling like yourself, if you're having thoughts that frighten you in any way, it's time to reach out. It's time to check in with your healthcare providers. Okay. It's time to have a conversation with your partner. And families often don't realize that partners can get postpartum depression as well. Hmm. This is a very important time for partners, for dads, for other family members. And most of the research has been on heterosexual partners, on fathers. Yeah. And the consensus is anywhere from 4 to 25% in the first three months. So that in some cases can be a higher incidence for men than for women. And men often don't have the resources or the outlets to talk about this. Yeah. It's not what people are thinking about when they're screening for postpartum depression, right? How's the partner doing? How's your partner doing? Yeah. And and I usually tell my family, you know, there are three things that increase your risk, even though this can happen to anybody and we can't predict if you've ever had a history of anxiety, of depression, of any sort of mood disorders, we should talk about that before the baby is born. We should make a plan together to make sure that you're prepared in case you're not coping well, in case you do have postpartum depression. The other thing we need to think about are your life stressors. Anything that makes life more challenging, takes your attention away from the immediate family unit, baby that's not born well, a strife with your partner, financial issues, anything unexpected, those can all increase your risk of postpartum depression. And then the third thing is sleep. I always like to say to families, you know, the world looks like a very different place when you've gone without sleep for one night. Yeah. Imagine how it will look if you have had poor sleep for two weeks. Right, right. So it's, it's important for families to work together to cocoon themselves, to try and prevent this and to reach out when they, they know that they need help. It's one thing to recognize potential postpartum depression in yourself, but what would somebody look for in their partner? If they're concerned about their partner, what are the kinds of signs somebody might see that, you know what, we better see a provider? You know, we, we often think of depression as someone who is lying in the bed, crying, um, really not functioning well in their daily life, but it can it can manifest in so many ways. Um, in male partners, it may just be irritability or anger. Um, for for new moms, it may be just irritability. Some moms will say, you know, I feel like I'm just going through the motions. I feel like my emotions are blunted. Hmm. I look at my baby and I feel like I should feel this overwhelming love, but I don't feel anything. I just feel like I have to take care of the baby. Mm -hmm. So it can manifest in a lot of ways. If your partner is irritable, if your partner is pushing you away, I'm sure you see this in many of your clients that you work with for depression. The nature of the disease is to push away the support that you need the most. Right, right. And to sort of isolate. Yeah. 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 So if your partner is isolating, if your partner is in any way not behaving in the way that you think is characteristic of their personality, it's time to have a conversation and maybe make an appointment. Yeah. Yeah. And I often say to women, how are your thoughts? Are you thinking things that are uncharacteristic of you? Are you thinking things that frighten you? Are you thinking of harm coming to your family members, to yourself? Those can be very things that we're not expecting, but they can be very telltale in how you're doing emotionally. Right. Right. 
I don't know if you can sort of sum this up, but what, you know, what advice or encouragement would you give to a couple that might be expecting their first baby? This is going to be a new thing in regard to their sexual relationship. Start the conversation before the baby is born. Mm. Talk as a couple, talk with your healthcare providers. We know that some healthcare providers are not comfortable bringing this up, but it's okay to bring up. It's okay if it's important to you to to start the conversation with your healthcare provider. What will it be like after the baby is born? With your partner, what will we do for birth control? It's a great way to open the conversation and then move it into how are we going to cope with the changes in our relationship? Yeah. Let go of this idea of normal. Make sure that you have some resources, some support, because, you know, it really does take a village to get through this time period. I think it's important to realize that you own your body, your sexual partner doesn't, your healthcare provider doesn't. So you get to define what you're comfortable with. You get to decide what your sexuality looks like. You get to decide when the time is right. And it's okay for new parents to have sex. And it's okay for women to have pleasure when they have sex. Those are all great nuggets of advice, actually. (laughs) The high points and and a fair amount of that I would put in general, not just around having a baby, right? Talk to your partner. There's no such thing as normal. Like throw that concept out, you know? So, yeah. Things will change. There will be, you know, there may be your normal, but your normal will be different now. Yeah. And that's okay. That's okay. And, And sometimes it can be even better. Yeah. So where can people learn a little bit more about you and what you're doing? Um, So I am a nurse midwife. Um, I have been laboring with women as a midwife for a little over 10 years now. And prior to that, I was a registered nurse on labor and delivery. My next project that I'm working on is a presentation that I will be giving this year at the American College of Nurse Midwives annual meeting. And this is a presentation for midwives and clinicians on how to identify and help women who have what we call hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Mm -hmm. In other words, women who've lost the spark. Right, right. Because I think it's very frustrating for women to bring this up to it's very stressful in their relationships. And I I think we as clinicians need to be better prepared to help women. So that's a project that I'm working on right now. And certainly you can look me up on the internet if you are in central Maryland and pregnant and interested in prenatal care or interested in talking about your sex life. Uh, Look me up on the internet and make an appointment. I'd love to talk to you. Wonderful. I will um, include a link uh, in the show notes too, so make it easier for people to find you. Oh, thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much for being with me. Oh, thank you, Jessica. Thank you for having me. Sure. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters. If you are interested in becoming a patron of the Better Sex Podcast, consider making a monthly pledge through patreon.com slash bettersexpodcast. You can find the link in the show notes as well. For as little as $2 a month, you'll get advanced access to every episode. And there are more rewards for greater donations. Thanks. I'd also ask if you have time to visit iTunes and subscribe to the podcast. You can rate and review the show, which helps other people find us. And if you found this episode resonated with you, I would love to hear from you. You can leave a comment on the episode page, which you'll find with the show notes. Let me know what you think. And if you've got questions you want me to answer on a future episode, you can also record a question for me right there, and I might play it on a future episode. Thanks for listening, and tune in again soon. Our theme music has been composed, recorded, and provided by Rick Ruskin, courtesy of Lion Dog Music.